welcome to the Alberta Transplant Institute seminar. I'd like to just take this uh, first opportunity to acknowledge where we're speaking from and um, that the land I'm sitting on and that the university is located on are primarily in the traditional territory of Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe nations, uh, lands that are now known as part of treaties six, seven, and eight, and homelands of the Métis. The University of Alberta respects the sovereignty, lands, histories, language, knowledge systems, and cultures of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations. I'd like to also take the time to thank Paladin for their support, uh, their ongoing support of the ATI seminar series. So thank you very much to Paladin. And a quick reminder to submit abstracts and uh, register for the ATI Research Day that's coming up uh, next month on June 20th and 21st. The deadline to submit abstracts is May 15th, and the links uh, will be posted in the chat, as you will see. So on to today's seminar. We're very excited today to welcome Dr. Caroline, Caroline Tate uh, to give our seminar today. Uh, she'll be speaking on linking macro and micro reconciliation in organ donation and transplantation. Where do we begin? Um, Dr. Tate holds a PhD in medical anthropology from McGill University and is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Saskatchewan. She's a member of the Métis Nation, Saskatchewan, and um, we've seen her uh, a lot um, in her prominent role recently as the nominated PI for the CIHR funded Networks of Environments for Indigenous Health Research National Coordinating Center and the Saskatchewan Indigenous Mentorship Nexture, um, um, Network. Together with Dr. Michael Moser, a kidney transplant surgeon in Saskatoon, Dr. Tate established, established the Saskatchewan First Nation and Métis Organ Donation and Transplantation Network, which is doing ter terrific things and helping us um, really move forward uh, work um, in this environment. That network is made up of First Nation and Métis elders, knowledge keepers, and persons with lived experience, researchers, physicians, and students. So bringing together um, in incredibly helpful ways all the people who need to be part of conversations in work in this area. So um, I'll hand it over to Dr. Tate now. Thank you very much for joining us today, Caroline. I, I didn't include what I usually do as a photograph of my family in that, but I grew up in a very very cool little Métis community um, uh, back in the 1960s and 70s. And, um, you know, it, it, it really has grounded, I think, the work that I do. And so I, I really focus on social justice issues in my research and looking at the ways in which we can improve systems of care um, for First Nations and Métis generally. Um, here in Saskatchewan and elsewhere, but I do have an interest also in Inuit and, and the really unique experience of Inuit people given um, geographical, um, the geographical areas in which they live. So I will, I will at speak to, to some of their um, challenges, but, but not, not as many as First Nations and Métis. And so I just have some learning objectives, which I think you have all seen. Um, and I, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to talk about the TRC and, and where, um, uh, where ODT fits in, but also I'm going to ask you some questions at the end, maybe for discussion. Um, I worked with um, Bill Mussel, uh, who's a Stolo elder from BC, who, who's absolutely a wonderful um, First Nations leader and has been for many, many decades and also Dr. Robert Henry. And, um, and we talk about what, what we call micro reconciliation. And this came out of a quote by Justice Murray Sinclair. And I, it, struck, it struck me as so important about the work and particularly it's, it's interesting in relation to organ donation and transplantation because this is such an intimate um, experience for people. I mean, one of, I, I can't think of many experiences that are more intimate than, than giving an organ to another person or, or you know, um, becoming an organ donor and knowing that, that um, you know, your organs, um, when you die, could go to other people, um, to be a family member, you know, who's making, you know, maybe a decision on behalf of a loved one or to be a recipient 
That's very funny because as I've done this work, so many people think about being an organ donor and would I or wouldn't I, how do I feel about it? But when you ask people about receiving an organ who aren't, you know, people who are waiting for an organ, it's very interesting in our communities because people don't think about being a recipient. And, you know, like, how would you feel when I asked the question, how would you feel if you had someone's, someone else's heart inside of you? So it, it, it's such a fascinating and, and intimate um, uh, um, area of healthcare, I think, um, because it involves so many different people. So Justice Murray Sinclair, I think his quote is so important for us to think about um, when we're thinking about talking to family members and we're thinking about talking to patients and, and people's lived experience. Um, so he says, we have to talk about reconciliation at the personal family community level. That is where true change will occur for it is in our daily lives where we seek and hopefully find peace. Our leaders need to show the way, but no matter how many deals and agreements they make, it is our daily conversations and inter interactions that our success as a nation and forging a better place will be ultimately measured. And that's what I'm gonna talk about um, uh, at the very beginning here is that bridging, what does it mean to bridge macro and micro reconciliation? And so the TRC calls to action, I think of them as a macro reconciliation. The calls to action are national in scope and they require the commitment and investment by governments, institutions and the private sector. So what, what I love about the calls to action is rather than recommendations, they, they name in, in many of the calls who should be doing the work and who has the responsibility of, of, of moving the actions forward along with um, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And, um, and so um, looking at the TRC calls to action, I pulled out the health calls to action. And, and how does reconciliation apply to care and treatment of end-stage organ failure, um, organ donation and transplantation, uh, healthcare delivery, and just the general support of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit patients and families who are going through the journey. Um, and and also um, that micro reconciliation different than, than, than the macro, which is the calls to action, right? Which, which has this national scope. And, and again, really, you know, is calling upon governments, so governments, institutions, the so private sector to do something. The micro reconciliation focuses on our everyday lives. What do we do as healthcare providers, as patients, um, and how, how do we as family members, and how does this link um, into the journey that Indigenous people have in terms of end-stage organ failure and, um, and organ donation and transplantation? And we argued in, in the paper that we wrote, we argued that to, to, to achieve micro-reconciliation, that you really, to, to bridge micro and macro reconciliation, you really need to link institutional values. Um, so the values of a hospital, um, the values of a health authority, um, the values of a provincial government with the everyday adoption of cultural safety and competencies. So as I looked at the cultural safety literature and the training, there's a lot of training um, in cultural safety, and I won't go into the difference between cultural safety and cultural competency, but, but generally it's about power and about shifting power to, to Indigenous patients and having Indigenous patients empowered in the healthcare, set, healthcare setting. Um, it addresses racism, so, it's, so cultural safety training is anti-racism training. Um, but what we argued is that, you know, we don't wanna get stuck in a context where all we're doing is training new healthcare providers, because there will always be new healthcare providers. So just training new healthcare providers in cultural safety and competencies without actually looking at the institutional values of the organizations, including institutional leaders. So if you're not supporting your workforce um, to, be, to, to provide culturally safe care and, and, and to be competent in that, um, if, if you don't have ways um, for your, um, for people working with our people. And so for instance, like if you look at, at organ donation and transplantation, talking to families about um, donating a loved one's organs, um, you know, this comes at a very, very intimate time of loss, um, you know, where, 
you know, not many of us really um, understand from a lived experience what it means to see your family member um, who who's been who has been diagnosed as being brain dead, and and so there's these intimate contexts of which um, you know related to that is the saving of the lives of other people, and and so to provide culturally safe care, um, you um, it, it is very very important that the institutional values of, of looking at the ways in which um, decision-making is done. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of equity and utility, um, but, but it's very important that, that the institutional values mirror the, the, the application of cultural safety. And, and so it's very important that, that senior administration not only be trained in cultural safety, but that, that in their leadership that they're embedding it within the institutions as a value. Um, and, and I will talk about that a little bit more um, to clarify that. Um, and, so, um, and so this needs to align and there hasn't been a lot of discussion in the cultural safety literature about that. Um, and so what I've seen is, you know, investment in training people in cultural safety, but not necessarily investment in the institution generally um, around the, around, um, uh, around those values. And um, so I'm going to start with this call of action, which is one of um, number 18. Uh, it's under health, and I, I won't go over all the health um, calls to action, but I pulled out a few of them. And this one, number 18, says we call upon the federal, provincial, territory, and Aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies including residential schools and to recognize and implement the healthcare rights of Aboriginal peoples as identified in international law, constitutional law and under treaties. Um, and so I just quickly, um, and there's a link to the calls to action um, to the website. So what are the rights of Indigenous people? Where do you find them? And so the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP as it's called, um, clearly outlines um, within it, the, the rights of Indigenous peoples globally. Um, in, in Canada, we have treaties, and treaties are treaties between First Nations and um, uh, the, Canadian, the Canadian government, the Canadian state. And so within that is treaty right to health. And, and I, I, um, I'm certainly not an expert on, on what it means for treaty right, treaty right to health, and there certainly is debate over what falls under that? What is the scope of treaty right to health? And, um, uh, but I can tell you, I have reviewed many, many, many CIHR grants that look at the, the health of First Nations peoples. And I've yet to see um, a proposal, including by Indigenous peoples, that actually meaningfully talks about treaty right to health. And so that's always been a bit of a, a, a stickler for me uh, about why why we're not talking about this more than, than what we are. We also have constitutional rights. First Nations, Métis and Inuit um, uh, are recognized in the Constitution of Canada. And of course, we have human rights like everyone else, um, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights, on the Human Rights, and, and also the rights of children um, apply. Um, and, and it's important in the context of any health care um, because uh, the intersection between um, child welfare, for instance, and other areas that where Indigenous children are over implicated um, intersect with, with their health care rights and, and their rights as Indigenous peoples. And so I, I use this example, and I think some of you maybe have heard me talk about David Dennis, but I think that he taught us something so important. And, and I don't want, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Dennis passed away, he was needing a liver transplant. And he challenged, as many of you know, he challenged the, the policy on liver donation and abstinence from alcohol use for six months. Um, and, and, and whether or not he could be placed on the transplant list because he hadn't been abstinence for, for six months. And I think at that time, it was two months and he challenged the science. Um, which, which to me is very interesting because most of the people I know who are First Nations, Inuit or Métis, would 
would really struggle to challenge the science part of it because they would feel that, you know, um, the experts, you know, would know best and and may be really reluctant to challenge um, the policy itself and just accept it as the status quo. Um, Non-Indigenous people, most likely many people would just do the same. So I think it's quite remarkable that he challenged not the science, right? And as we know, um, it was determined that, you know, the policy wasn't as robust as what, um, as what was thought. And so he was placed on the transplant list, um, but unfortunately did not receive a transplant before he passed away. Um, but Mr. David highlighted, uh, or sorry, Mr. Dennis highlighted to us that you can't understand questions of equity and utility in ODT decision-making without understanding the historical impacts of colonialism and how this relates to present-day healthcare policy and, and service delivery provi provided to Indigenous groups. So the most significant determinant of health for First Nations, Métis and Inuit remains government policies. It remains the policies that are implemented through the human service sector. Um, and that, that includes education, um, criminal justice, healthcare, um, and social welfare, for example. But government policies still have an enormous pack, impact. Um, and so when he, um, he gave us a very good example of how this works. So what Mr. Dennis argued is that the optimal conditions existed through processes of colonization in which alcohol was used as a um, weapon or tool to marginalize, discriminate, um, and divorce indigenous peoples from their land and resources, and, and for which um, there was an over-representation of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who became um, addicted to alcohol or abused alcohol. And so his point was you created the optimal conditions for this to happen. And then, and then when we become sick from it, when we become um, ill from it, and that it translates intergenerationally, that then you're withholding the very thing that we need, we need to live and because we are overrepresented. And so you know, you can think whatever you like about his argument, right? And I'm not going to, to say much more about his argument, but the point that I'm raising today is that whether you agree or disagree with Dennis David, whether you know how that, that applies then to the context in which he was in, for instance, individually or, or, or to the larger context of the decision-making around liver transplant and alcohol use disorder, um, what he does is he, 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 he teaches us that the uniqueness, the unique historical experience of Indigenous peoples means that we need to be reflective and we need to engage Indigenous leadership and Indigenous peoples because the perspective might be very different because of the collective lived experience, because of what happened historically. And, and because there is still as a result of colonization, this huge disadvantage. And, um, uh, um, and so, so uh, he also taught us that the perspectives of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit are distinct and are grounded in intersecting considerations such as culture, language, colonial history, geography, and other factors. And I'll talk about that more um, as, as we go on. Um, and in a clinical context, it is easy to dismiss the rights of Indigenous peoples and their collective lived experience, including the impact of uh, the impact collective lived experience has had on individuals lived, lived experience. So in a context where you have a scarce resource, and, and, and this is really where, you know, we need to have much, much more discussion of, amongst Indigenous peoples and then with others is in a clinical context where you're talking about a scarce resource, um, you know, does it become easier then to dismiss the rights of Indigenous people and this collective experience that's historical um, that is linked to Indigenous rights that, that Mr. Mr. Um, Dennis points us towards. Um, moving on now to, to call to action. I, I'm going to try to get through these, but, but I may not get through all of them because I, I would like us to have some time um, for discussion. 
Um, this is um, around looking at data and measurable goals and to look at what are the indicators that indigenous people have to, to determine um, their health status and, and also to determine equity and inequities in the healthcare system. And, and related to that are the jurisdictional disputes concerning Aboriginal people who don't, do not re reside on reserve um, and I'll explain that a bit, bit more for those of you who don't know, but I imagine most of you are quite aware of the jurisdictional so issues. Um, so we have limited um, ODT data on Indigenous people. There, it's very, very limited. There's some really, there's some, some um, interesting studies that, that have been um, from Canada here, a few studies, um, but we certainly need more data um, and um, most of the data is status First Nations patients um, and groups um, because of this of, of status, the status number of which then you can identify them as being First Nations. Um, but but oftentimes, even though researchers are talking about status First Nations, they'll use the term Indigenous, and this is a real problem for for us because it masks the lack of attention to Inuit, Métis and non-status First Nations groups and fails to highlight the jurisdictional issues experienced by distinct, distinctive Indigenous groups. So for instance, if you're a Métis person living in Northern Saskatchewan and there's a medical transportation that's running people from say, um, La Ronge to Prince Albert for dialysis um, a couple times a week. So from the La Ronge Indian Band, um, if you're a Métis person, you can't access that same service. So the jurisdictional means that as Métis, we're covered by provincial and First Nations are covered by the federal government. So the federal, federal government um, under First Nations in, you know, with health branch and non-insured health benefits will pay for, for medical transportation when, when Métis do not have that same benefit. And so what does that mean uh, in the context um, for Métis people or for non-status? Um, and uh, so what we're seeing now, because our leaders have been pushing back towards the federal government, um, and hopefully this will translate to provincial governments, um, we're looking at distinction-based health legislation, which is meant, which is really meant in the context of, of organ donation and, con and transplantation, for instance, is that we would make sure that um, any data that was collected, any information that we know about Indigenous people is broken down. So we get, we have a better understanding of how many Métis people, how many Inuit people, how many First Nations people, where do they come from? So that we have richer data, which, which we really, really need. Um, and that, and without distinctions-based data, we can't address issues of healthcare and ec healthcare equity and ODT. So when you have no data, it's oftentimes in Indigenous context, it's like the problem doesn't exist. So it's an invisible problem because there is no data to draw upon. So even though healthcare providers will be advocating for better supports for Indigenous patients and trying all kinds of innovative ways, um, uh, if we don't have that data at that macro level, right, then it's really hard for our leadership to argue um, for better supports and services. Um, and um, and so, it's, so, so it's highly, highly important um, and so moving on to call 23, we call upon all levels of government. So this is increasing um, the number of students in our health sciences that are indigenous and uh, indigenous professionals. So why is that, why is that important? Um, and so, so indigenous leaders right now are largely absent from the ODT decision-making tables. And, and I don't blame anyone for this um, uh, ex it's like an oversight in some ways um, that needs to be addressed. And, and I certainly find within the, the ODT community, and it really feels like a community that I, I just am so overwhelmed by the amount of interest that people have. And I feel bad that, that you know, I'm looking for other Indigenous people um, that are working in this area, but, but we're gonna get more people and more researchers and more perspectives, because I'm just one. But, but the, the level of, of, of support and kind, I have to say real kindness. Um, so there's no, I've, I've not talked to anyone who doesn't want more indigenous people at, at the table, right? Um, and I, I'm not meaning just patient partners who are highly important, indigenous patient partners, highly important. Frontline workers are important. 
and researchers are important, right? But our indigenous leadership, they're the ones who are talking to the ministries of health. They're the ones who are talking to, to their constituents and, and, and talking to their frontline workers and, and, and working with the researchers. So, so our leadership is really important. Um, so we need to increase training across the health sciences, but, but we need to include training in health administration and indigenous leadership. So, so we need to have indigenous healthcare leaders that, that really intimately understand the challenges that exist within large scale hospitals, um, transplants programs, for instance. And, and we don't really have that quite yet. And so, um, and there just is a shortage of people, but, but the ways in which you can support that is whenever you get a chance to have a student intern, when you have, anytime you get a, a chance to support our young people and support um, you know, the movement of indigenous people into leadership roles, whether they're meant for, for indigenous specific leadership roles or not, but to, but to really help to mentor um, people into those roles. Um, uh, and, and we're seeing a shift, like our, our generations, are, our, our next generation is so, such incredible young people. Um, but you have to understand, you know, and I, I heard this in a meeting where somebody said, but we called, you know, this indigenous organization and they never got back to us. Um, and you have to understand that our indigenous health leaders, um, we're not big, robust organizations. Um, um, and even if we are, the health part of it is one of a number of overlapping things and a number of overlapping health issues. Um, so they're often overburdened in their daily work lives and they're dealing and, and our health leaders. Um, so if you want to partner, um, they're in a position that I, I'm commonly in as a researcher as well, is that I just can't snap my fingers and have all the chiefs line up for, for a project or have the Métis leadership line up for a project. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very unique, um, very sensitive dance. And, uh, you know, and I often tell my students that when I go to partner with our people, even though, you know, people know me here and, and you know, like I have pretty good reputation, I think, um, I always say to my students, we'll, we'll probably go three times to, to meet with that group. And the first two times, they're going to tell us a lot of angry things about researchers and, and, and about, you know, what researchers have done, what government has done. And, and I would say to the students, please, you know, sit and listen with compassion, with respect, and with humility. And that's cultural safety kind of at a macro level, right, is that you're dealing with the leadership and the leadership, um, you know, are, are letting you know that they know how things can get off track and, and work in their favor. And then usually I said on the third time, you know, by being humble, by by having that humility that you will be able to start to build the partnership. And it's so important, important to have our indigenous leadership there. And then um, this is the very last one. Um, we call upon medical nursing schools, um, you know, in terms of training of, of, of people generally, and this goes back to, to the rights piece. And, and I wanna return us now to, um, to what, do, what does that mean, right? Human rights. Um, um, anti-racism. What what does that mean when we're looking at the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? So what sh what should we teach students about the rights of Indigenous peoples? Um, um, you know, when we're looking at training people in, spe in specialties, um, and I'm not just talking about physicians. I'm talking also about social work students, for instance. So social workers um, are key to to talking to families, right? Or or um, you know, we have, um, what should we be teaching nurses? What should we be teaching across that spectrum of healthcare providers about indigenous peoples and indigenous rights? Um, what is the application of rights in a context where there's a scarce resource? And that's what David Dennis really asked us to, really challenged us, right? Um, you know, because he's saying, yeah, I, I know it's a scarce resource, but I'm saying that on this other side, there are such unique circumstances. And how do we weigh those two things together? Um, and I'd love, I'd love to have a discussion about this. Um, what is the application of rights in a geographical context where there are limited or no healthcare services? So, 
so when I look at, at rights, for instance, um, and I don't have answers. Um, I have a lot of questions as, as we're beginning to understand all of this better, but we had one um, narrative, a, a story of, of a person who came to our think tank and spoke about their family and her aunt who had a child who required a heart transplant. And they lived in the very, very, very far north um, in the Northwest Territories. And the child did receive a heart transplant um, in Edmonton and they had to make the most difficult. And, and I can't put myself in, in the place of this parent. I, I have no idea what I would do. I, it just broke my heart. But because they had a number of other children, they lived in the far north, they really had no option to relocate to Edmonton. And so they had to um, give their daughter up for adoption so that she could have a transplant and live close to the services that she need, needed post-transplant. And so what is the application of that child's rights in that context, the right, her right as, a, as an Indigenous person to live on her land and be with her people and be with her family. Um, you know, how do we apply it in this context? Um, and so these are questions that don't come up often for other groups of people, but are, are do come up um, as people are making decisions about their health care um, and about living off, off their territory, off their, their traditional land. And, and living off your traditional land is really, really difficult, um, particularly when you are somebody who lives a very traditional lifestyle. And so in Northern Saskatchewan, for instance, we have many, many Diné people and Cree people who hunting and trapping, um, uh, um, having their trap land and going onto the land is a huge piece of their, their, their lifestyle, their well-being, their identity, all of that, right? So, so that's another question. Um, and then I'll just say briefly about the presumed consent or opt-out legislation. So I have one question for everybody that has nothing to do with my talk. And that's, it was in a meeting, somebody said that deemed consent and presumed consent are not the same thing. And I've looked and looked and I can't, I can't see any, any place where, where, where they're not I think they're used interchangeably. So that's, that's, it's crazy when you have a presenter who's asking a question um, uh, uh, in this way, but, but it, I, I've, I've looked through and I was trying to find out whether it's the same because, because I heard it in a meeting the other day and I didn't get a chance to ask, ask the person what they meant. Um, but in terms of presumed consent, um, uh, which is the term that I know, um, what our people will say about presumed consent is that there was no, um, and I've talked to some, some colleagues in Nova Scotia, there was the duty to consult. So, so in this context, I'm not entirely sure whether there's a legal duty to consult, um, but if nothing else, there, there is an ethical duty to consult um, a nation to nation um, because, of, because of the implications of presumed consent. <coughs> Excuse me. So presumed consent. Yeah, um, I think, and I'm sorry, I don't have any water here. <coughs> but I think for our people, um, presumed consent, um, the critique would be, will this mean that we become a source of organs? but the equity issues that prevent us now from receiving a transplant, those equity issues, the utility issues, the interface of utility of, you know, not being able to travel on snowy roads to, to, to comply to all the workup for a transplant or post-transplant if somebody decides, well, you know, that person isn't going to be able to comply. Oh, <laughs> Diego's on the call, so you bring your water. Thank you so much. Um, you know, so, so I think one of the, the questions that people will have is, does this mean that we're going to become this source of organs? So, so because of the high rates, um, we know that we have higher rates within our youth population, for instance, of motor vehicle accidents and other types of, of accidents that, you know, may mean that, that, um, you know, that, that um, this is someone who can, who can donate an organ um, or organs, sorry, that could be an organ donor. Um, and so I think that's one of the 
the the challenges around the presumed consent right is 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 that you know what what does this mean right and then um and then people feeling too about citizenship and their value within the society you know so does this mean that maybe somebody's going to pronounce me to be dead before i'm dead right so or they're going to procure my organs prematurely um you know which i know that healthcare people say no 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 we have all these checks and balances in place but but it goes back to the perception of of inclusive discussion inclusive dialogue um you know when any any type of of legislation that has a, a cultural um a moral um uh, importance for Indigenous people that it, that it's important to um, to consult um, with them, and and so um, this pretty much wraps up um, my talk. I uh, I wanted to leave it a little bit open in terms of those questions, um, and you know this question around, you know um, what should we, how should we be moving forward with this, and what are the application of the rights in the context where we have. Um, where organs are a scarce resource, right? And we're all trying to, to address this um, through, you know, more organ donors, um, you know, um, looking at, at death in terms of not only a brain death, but also cardiac death and, and others. So, so I'll just leave it at that and, and hopefully we can have some discussion. Thank you very much, Caroline. That was really so interesting. I learned so much every time I I listen to you. It's so it's so the nuances are, you know, you you get at all the new the complexities and nuances that, um, you know, you really don't have a chance to get in many senses. So thank you very much. Um, are there questions for Caroline from the audience? Maybe I could just start while people are um, are are thinking about things. Um, I don't even know where to start. So many things to think about. Um, the issue. So I was at a meeting last week where um, John Forsyth from who's been very active in this regard in the National Health Service in the UK talked about um, opt out uh, kinds of the differences and, and you've brought it up the differences between presumed consent deemed consent. Um, opt out and other phrases that are used more, and I found it too, that seem to me to be used more or less interchangeably. And um, I'm not, I'm certainly not an expert on this and I wish Matt Weiss was on the call uh, or Sonny Danani, but um, he, he alluded to the fact that in some jurisdictions deemed consent based on um, either what, what was known about the, the generally the kind of backgrounds of people in that area and he was comparing Wales, Scotland, England and Northern Ireland so you know in some places deemed was was a, a, a kind of um was slightly different than presumed consent because it was implying an active a more active process of deeming consent versus a, a passive aspect of presuming consent but but you're what right there they're quite they're uh, they're, they're things that need to be really sorted out and, and considered through the lens of not just indigenous Aboriginal peoples, but all, as you pointed out, the different sub, you know, that we tend to lump together because we, we many of us don't know enough about the specific designated First Nations versus Inuit versus Métis and the non-status groups that may have a lot to say about this issue. What do you, I mean, do you think there's a, a way of kind of getting at that through the various um uh collaborative wor workshops and forums that were currently underway yeah i think um uh, uh we we've been working we definitely have been working with metis nation you know so that there is is a better understanding certainly in terms of research um like ethical guidelines and and how metis and first nations you know are different and um uh, and then, but I'm very encouraged by the health legislation of the federal government around distinctions based legislation because that's going to force everybody who works um, with First Nations, Metis, and Inuit to think differently, including the provinces, I think, to think differently about how you track, you know. So, so we had a study in Saskatchewan on HIV rates, and the provincial government used Indigenous, and it was useless, right? Because because um, 
Métis again are under provincial, you know, and First Nations on reserve are federal. And, and so as we know, um, Jordan's principle, which is many of you have probably heard about, you know, that principle was all about the jurisdictional fighting of who pays for, who was to pay for this child's care, who was to pay for this child to go home. And um, I had one person in our study who I think she mentioned something like her dad, they were dealing with 12 or more jurisdictions, meaning that um, she was using the term jurisdictions, but it really, it really, what I think she meant was, was stakeholders who had a, who had a stake in her father's movement from hospital to home, which was way up in the north, and and nobody had the responsibility to take him from the plane to his home. They could only take him from the plane to the health center, and so so these types of things are things that people. Um, you know, in our, in, in, that, that people are dealing with, you know, trying to sort out during really difficult, difficult times. And that's why, like, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, David Dennis, you know, really taught us, like his lesson, um, you know, cause he was an activist, his lesson around, you know, um, being reflective and, and, and reflecting on the whole process, not just that you have a scarce resource and it should go the utility question, right? So it should the, the uh, liver should go to the patient that will, it will be the most effective in and have the most, you know, for the longest period of time, right? So those utility, utility, um, you know, he was challenging us around that to say, okay, but how does that work with colonialism? How does that work with the colonial, like like how colonialism has disadvantaged, right? So that equity and utility. Um, and I don't know the answers to all of these things. I think I think he he was challenging us. I don't I didn't know them know him, and and I have, haven't read a lot about him. But but he reminds me of other other leaders. Um, but I think he was challenging us with the aim in mind of having us just think about it, you know, because because even if we don't have easy answers, the thought that people are thinking about it makes a difference too right well I, I think you're you're absolutely right and then the difference um not just equity and utility but also um system-wide versus individual um considerations and if we're not thinking about it on all those levels so system-wide for example the transplant teams and how they set up processes in order to move forward every day and every week or the or the medical student learning to teach, you know, a, a, a certain curriculum versus decisions that are made on, um, you know, on very individual levels that also have to be included. Uh, so we have um, we have a couple of questions. Let me take up from uh, from the audience. First of all, Linda Powell, you've got your hand up. Would you like to put your camera and speaker? I Hello, Carolyn. Thanks for a terrific presentation. I just really enjoy speaking to you always and listening to your comments. Um, this uh, speaks to you know, the issues of federal and provincial jurisdiction and, of course, data sharing for health information. And with provinces being responsible for delivery of health care and then that division between, for example, Métis and other um nations how does that all work so is there work going on at the federal level to help with data sharing because of those challenges versus the provinces dealing with it individually and yeah. i did miss a few minutes at the beginning so i apologize if it's a repeat of what you've already said no i i'm still learning about all the the where data lives and 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 where you can access but but certainly the Fir first nations are doing a much uh, they're much ahead of the metis and the inuit in the sense that we have the first the regional health survey and that's one area where i've, I've got a I, I i've been back and forth with jonathan dewar with first nations information health um to see whether there's any questions on the regional health survey about ODT and 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 you know I'm trying to get the questions. Um, so that survey is all under the control of First Nations. Um, when it comes to 
so so the so when it comes to health utilization data right so so how how are indigenous people moving through the healthcare system there is no data so so in the transplant program here um mike moser did an informal audit and found um two two times uh, uh about four years apart and found that there was no change but but that around 50 percent of the people on the wait list were status first nations so he could tell by this they could tell by the status so they did this informal audit um, we don't know though, um, uh, Métis people, right? So we don't know. So with Métis, we think it might be less because rates of diabetes. And so, so we're, we're doing all these different calculations, right? And, but it's really hard to tell where I think at the national level now that national ODT table, which um, uh, I think it, uh, uh, I can't remember who, who begged and pleaded for me to get on it. So I'm there. Uh, I'm, I'm a qualitative researcher. I don't really understand data. And so I kind of fake my way through. Um, but, uh, but there is definitely, you know, um, people have been, again, very kind community of people. So I keep raising my hand and saying the same question about distinctions based data, because without it, um, you know, you either get this, you either get First Nations, if you get anything, and, and you don't get Métis. So we're, we're hoping, you know, to start to work with the Indigenous leadership, you know, so that we can um, see if we can, we can, you know, get, have agreements. But, but the provincial in Saskatchewan is not the greatest. Um, it's better in Alberta. So different provinces allow more um, people to look at the data, but we've, we've been challenged generally in Saskatchewan with, with, health utilization and, and other data yeah maybe it's a one example where the the provincial federal you know yet one other example where the federal provincial arrangement for health care is uh it's just difficult it's so difficult at the you know at the provincial level uh in trying to take care of things that clearly might be more beneficial if handled nationally um patricia you have a question uh, yes, thanks very much, Karen, for, for a great talk, as always. Um, thinking about a couple of the, the really important concepts that you raised, the, the nation-to-nation discussion, um, long-term relationship building, engaging, engaging um, Indigenous health leadership. Um, and I'm thinking about the, specifically in research, the different levels of relationships that, in, that should be in place, but also this, this continuing challenge of, of capacity within different levels of research, for example, you know, CDTRP at the national level, um, you know, ATI as a, as a provincial kind of level of research and then individual institutions, individual researchers, what are the right alignments there for the relationships that, that we should build? Yeah, so, so this is always, I, I'm challenged by this all the time and COVID has kind of made, made it even worse, although, although we're coming out of this. So, so here's the challenge um, around anything that anybody does, in, including me, right? So, so, there's, so um, our leadership to partner have a constituency of people. So whenever you're going to talk to an indigenous leader, in their mind, they're thinking, are my people going to be supportive of this or not, right? So, and it depends on what it is, right? So it depends on the topic area that some are easier than others, right? So if you're going in and you're going to collect blood samples, for instance, or tissue sample, like if you're gonna collect any kind of biological, that's like a no-no, you know, like, like you can almost guarantee that you will get an immediate pushback, a very negative pushback, right? So, so our leadership knows that any kind of, you know, blood sampling or anything like that has to proceed differently um, than say that, so, so, um, so for instance, I'm doing data collection now, and you guys will, will, will laugh at this, but it's very encouraging. So, so we're looking at lived experience. Um, we're looking at, you know, so living donation. We're looking at, at all, all kinds of different things, right? Um, and we just put it out on Facebook and, you know, we have all these connections and, and, and our people 
want to tell their stories. They want people to hear their stories and they individually own their stories, right? So any indigenous person can participate in research without having, you know, a leader say if they can or they can't. But where where you where we run into to to the question of sovereignty is when then you start to talk about indigenous people and and as a category within your research, you know, that that you're comparing, say, for instance, indigenous to non-indigenous. And so if you're comparing First Nations to Metis, then you need to have both First Nations and Metis approval. And that's where you go to the leadership. The challenge with our leadership, as I said, is that um, they're really overtaxed with requests all the time because they're getting requests not only around research from university people, but also then, you know, um, um, like right now, uh, you know, a number of people have emailed me about the Health Canada call, right? So that was like three months. So all of a sudden, leadership to partner on that, you know, have to kind of just stop everything and create so so the timeline was so short on that um but that's what they're responding so they're responding mostly to requests not for research but requests for interventions like the health canada thing and anything else that comes up they're just pushing and pushing to get proposals in and some communities are better some better than others metis are terrible because we have no resources we have no infrastructure you know so unless you're talking about metis nation saskatchewan um, there are a few of the locals that have the capacity, but other than that, partnering with Métis is really difficult. Um, Alberta is better because you have the, um, the settlements. So, so there, there seems to be, I don't know really well, but more infrastructure there. Um, but it's, it's a real challenge for our leadership and, and there's just only so many places you can be, right? You know, and so then it makes it really hard for us to get those partnerships. So, so one of the things, you know, again, is, is I think, you know, um, trying to, trying to address that by, I think some of the lived experience work, um, you know, and having a base of, of Indigenous patient partners is important. Um, and then partnering maybe with just smaller organizations and the bigger organizations and that, but, but I'm not saying that it's, 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 it's incredibly time consuming and it's incredibly challenging at times. And then you, our leadership changes them too, right? So I had one project where I had six different health directors for one community. So, so building relationships, you know, and so what I say to people is this, it's like, you know, this is work that is work. I talk about, you know, pragmatic solidarity. This is about walking with indigenous people where they're at and walking with them. Um, when people say, oh, we need to get this in because the deadline's like in three weeks or two weeks. Well, you know what? There'll be other opportunities. There always is. And, and, and no project is gonna be that important that, that it should supersede all of these other things. Um, but we do need, I think, adv people advocating. So the o at the ODT table, the national tables is, not only saying to Health Canada, you know, and others, we need to have Indigenous leaders here, but to say, you need to budget in. So, so if you're leading this big ODT initiative, you need to budget in so that, like, enough resources so that you can go to the Assembly of First Nations or you can go to the Métis National Council and say, we budgeted in this much money for you to send somebody to the table, right? You know? Um, and even within our own organizations, like Métis National Council, finding Métis people to work at them. Like, I know it sounds crazy, but it goes back to that call to action number 23 or whatever. We need to train people, you know, we need to train Indigenous people. So that starts um, at all levels. And, and in ODT, I mean, it can start with people going into high schools and presenting on organ donation and transplantation. And then highlighting, you know, saying we need more indigenous, you know, young people focused on this. Here's my card, you know, if you're indigenous, here's my card, you know, and so, but it's just going to take more time. Yeah. So Patricia, I don't know if that answered your question. That was a little roundabout. 
Well, I think it highlights the need, as you've said, and it's going to take a long time, I think, to affect the, to for leadership and to train people, you know, to become leaders doesn't happen overnight. It takes a, a long time. I think we have time for just one last question from Anne Halpin. And um, she's put it in the chat box. But Anne, you're there. Why don't you just go ahead? And oh, <laughs> hi. Thank you so much. I don't think you should ever worry about being repetitive <laughs> in a talk because I learn something different every single time I get to hear you, which hasn't been that many times. But <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, and you did touch on living donation a little bit just now in the discussion, but I, it seemed like a lot of the conversation in the presentation was around deceased organ donation. I just wondered if you think there's different pieces to consider or you know, additional things, which is your thoughts on that. It's, it's such a good question. And, and as, as we are learning, um, you know, I have a project on living donation and I thought people would talk about the cultural aspect, right? So what does it mean? And, you know, and they do talk about that somewhat. However, you know, at the bottom line, what comes down often is that my family ne member needed me and I'm the one in the family, right? You know, so I'm the one in the family. Um, but, but, um, but what we're seeing, of course, is what many people see, but the equity issue, I think, is compounded. And that's around geography. Geography is huge. Um, so first of all, finding, finding a compatible donor within your family who's not at risk as well is also a problem, right? So you guys know that, that that's, you know, so people are looking for living donors in their families and, and sometimes it's really hard to, to find somebody who themselves won't be at risk later on in life. So that's one thing, but, but the second thing is, is the cost that it caught, like to travel, right? And that compliance to go through the workup and so the question I have back, because, you know, compliance to go through the workup and, and um, you know, so, so for the living donor, um, you know, like, as you know, and, and lots of people are, John Gill talks about this, about, you know, um, like you have to take time off work. And so, so we've seen all of that where people are taking their holidays, they have to take time off, off work. There's, there's a real reluctance to ask relatives. So there's a shyness or you know, um, to ask somebody for, for that, um, you know, but, but I think with living donation is, um, you know, here, here's my question. So, so if we have Northern, can we use virtual technology? Is there a role for virtual technology in terms of living donation where we could create a context where there could be so, so I work with Dr. Ivor Mendez, who, who some of you might know, who, who's a surgeon and who heads up virtual care in Saskatchewan and has globally. So, so is there a role for virtual care to help to, 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 to support living donors to go through that workup? Because that's one of the major things, um, you know, uh, and so, yeah. And, and then, you know, we're still trying to get our head around, you know, is it appropriate from a medical point of view, an ethical point of view, to actually campaign for people to become living donors? Is that, is that because, because, and I still, maybe I'm just a dum-dum, but I'm still trying to figure out where the medical people land on this because they're saying, yes, it is safe. But on the other hand, then, you know, I've said, well, why don't we do a campaign then? And we've got 50% of the people waiting for kidneys or First Nations or Métis. Why don't we campaign? And our people will, you know, I could see people rising to the occasion. And then people were like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, so, so I think, you know, I would imagine the hesitancy is because, you know, there, there's always risk, right, associated with it. Um, but also maybe liability and other things like that. I don't know, but, but, but we definitely, the, um, the virtual, the remote presence technology, does it have a role, right, in ODT and what does that look like? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, sorry, I was just saying, I think that's a really good question because I think there's like these sort of two buckets of barriers. There's the systemic geological, you know, barrier where if you're not in a major city where all the tests happen, that's a problem. And I know that in Ontario, there is a pilot, my understanding of a single day workup, which I think could be really important in that context, because some things can't be virtual, some can. But, um, you know, if it could be done in a concise amount of time, even if that meant that you occasionally wasted tested, a mm -hmm. you know, did a test you wouldn't have done because the first test was, you know, ruled somebody out or whatever. 
I think we would learn a lot from that anyway. So I think the single day workup would be valuable for every donor, but in particular, people who live remotely. And then there's the biologic barrier, like you said, the, you know, the increased likelihood of having mm -hmm. some, you know, um, you know, medical reason to be ruled out. And, and another barrier that I don't think we talk about is the ABO blood group barrier, which I think is, you know, most likely, or you're probably more likely to be ABO O or B if you're mm -hmm. First Nations or Indigenous or Métis. I'm not sure about Métis. We don't actually know. We don't have enough data around that. But those are the, org the ABO groups that also wait the longest. And so this is like another piece that I don't know that we're talking enough about either. So I, I, I don't have answers, but I do think that the single day workup would be really good for every donor, but maybe especially for donors who are coming from remote places. Yeah. Sorry, Lori, I cut you off. <laughs> And that's okay. Uh, we're just um, just keeping an eye on the clock here. I think those are really, really good comments. And I know, you know, you know, maybe there's room to think about having, um, a, you know, workshops on specific aspects of living donation that are mm -hmm. have been affected by the pandemic and that could be beneficial and bringing in the specific nature of some of those that are related to the various Indigenous communities um, as we've seen here and, and you know, targeted system systems advances, organizational advances that might, you know, that might help. Um, we, we kind of are out of time, but thank, thank you to Caroline and thank you to everyone who asked such really, really good questions. It's, um, it's so helpful. It tells us how much work we still need to do, but it's encouraging that, that you know, for things like today and seminars and, and uh, working groups through Health Canada and, and the CDTRP and the ATI that we, we begin to see some progress in that. I know um, um, uh, that speaking of the Toronto group, you know, having a living donor center that specifically focuses on, you know, issues that may be related not across the whole system, but to some individual groups may be really helpful. Anyway, thank you again, Caroline. Um, next week's seminar, I'll just say, uh, is uh, will be presented by Janice Bytel and Kelly Robillard from Trillium Gift of Life in, um, in Ontario. And they're gonna be talking about routine notification legislation, uh, implementation and beyond. And you can see the link in the chat box right there. Um, and once again, we thank Paladin for uh, supporting the seminar series and we encourage uh, everyone to have a look at um, the upcoming research day uh, abstract and reservations. Uh, so thank you again to all of you and especially Caroline. Thank you so much.